Welcome to the Catholic Community Scripture Study held at St. John the Evangelist Catholic Church in Jackson, Michigan. I will be your host, Todd Gale, as we walk our way through the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to the Gospel of St. Matthew. My name is Todd Gale, and I will be your host today as we walk through this chapter 6 of the Gospel of Matthew. We're still in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus has talked about when you give alms and when you pray. We're in that section where he's talking about prayer. We're not going to cover a lot of ground today because this is really dense. We're picking up in verse 7. Now, first of all, something about prayer. St. John Chrysostom wrote about the spiritual healthy practice of continuously praying day and night, all throughout the day. Nothing, he says, is equal to prayer. For what is po impossible, prayer makes possible. What is difficult, prayer makes easy. For it is impossible, utterly impossible, for the man who prays eagerly and invokes God ceaselessly ever to sin. Isn't that amazing? So he's giving us a really major secret in the spiritual life. If you don't want to sin, be in prayer. Amen. Isn't that awesome? St. John Chrysostom. St. Alphonsus Liguori said something that's really uh, difficult. Those who pray are certainly saved, and those who do not pray are certainly damned. He just calls it out, right? It's St. Alphonsus. Well, let's, let's look at what Jesus says about prayer. The right way to prayer in chapter 6, this is verse 7 and 8. When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles. They'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, right? Um, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ever even ask them. Where the Revised Standard Version of the Bible says, do not heap up empty phrases, other translations say things like, do not babble repeatedly as the pagans, or avoid vain repetition as the pagans or the heathens. Lots of times our Protestant friends will use these lines to teach that Catholics are in error for repeating lots of prayers, like in the Rosary, in the Divine Mercy Chaplet, or, or even at Mass, when we, when we seem to continuously pray the Our Father or the Hail Mary. But Catholic repetition of prayers is not automatically vain repetition. They're certainly not empty phrases. Vain repetition means that most, it's, it's all words mostly, right? Words with no meaning. It's all lips and no heart, no mind. The way the pagans and the heathens prayed would be like to badger the gods, right? Just, just God, bring us rain, bring us rain, bring us rain, you know, that sort of thing. In 1 Kings chapter 18, the prophets of Baal are crying out, Oh, Baal, answer us, it says, for half the day. In Acts 19, there's a mob in Ephesus that shouts, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians for two hours. They just repeat that over and over. Pagans would repeat the names of their deities over and over, more like an incantation or like casting a spell or like badgering their God until he listened to them. Look, repetitious prayers are at the heart of Jewish praying, and Jesus is thoroughly Jewish. They prayed the Shema and the Amidah multiple times a day. We talked about that last time. Jesus was through and through Jewish. He did not say to avoid repeated good Jewish prayers that come from sacred scripture. He said avoid vain and empty prayers like the pagans, like the Gentiles. And the very next thing that Jesus does is he says, pray like this 
and he gives us a prayer that is meant to be repeated. And it was known to be repeated, the Our Father. We know for a fact the Didache, a writing of the Twelve Apostles at the, at the end of the first century, at the latest when it was written. It's the oldest writing we have outside of Scripture that gives us some outline of what the Christians believed. It says that Christians prayed the Our Father three times a day. So I'm being a little snarky here with my Protestant brothers and sisters that argue that any repetition of prayer is, is vain. Well, let me ask you, are the angels accused of vain repetition and empty phrases? Because they sing holy, holy, holy all day and night in the book of Revelation, chapter 4. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, full of eyes all around and within, day and night, they never cease to sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Now these four living creatures refer back to four angels, four seraphim that Isaiah spoke about in Isaiah chapter 6, 700 years earlier. So for 700 years before this time, they've been singing, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Someone needs to tell these angels about vain repetition. According to many of our Christian brothers and sisters, they need to just knock it off and pray something different. Right? No, 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 my friends, Jews and Christians have prayed the Psalms over and over repetitively for thousands of years. Psalm 136 in itself repeats the words, for his steadfast love endures forever, 26 times in the 26 verses. Doesn't that sound like repetition? Perhaps most importantly, we have Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane in Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 14, where he says to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He goes off, he prays that, that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he comes back and he sees that, that they've fallen asleep and he goes back again and he comes back a third time and he prays the same words, it tells us. Three times. Is Jesus accused of repetitive praying? Our Lord is here praying for hours. And he's saying the same words. Okay, there's nothing wrong with repetition. Just don't make it vain repetition. Amen? Do we get that? that that's really big. Then he gives us the model prayer. The Our Father. This prayer says, above all else, it says we believe in God. And it's assumed that there is a loving, benevolent Father God who calls us to be like him. Pope Benedict XVI, may God bless him and rest his soul, he writes that this prayer is written in the first person plural. So we're all gathered together as a we and we are praying this together. We are God's children, reaching up beyond this world to our Father. And so we begin, our Father who art in heaven. There's no evidence of anyone ever before Jesus using the term our Father addressed to God in a group. When God revealed himself to Abraham, and God gave his name to Moses. He never said, I am the Father. To Solomon, that's the first time we read that the Lord says, I will be a father to him. But it seems at first this fatherhood is only following the house of David and the house of Solomon. The, the average Israelites, the lay people, are never told to call God our Father. Yet, yet, not until Jesus He's our father. Jesus is in the house of David. And, and Jesus transfers his status as a son to all of us. We're adopted. We receive the gifts of the father. And we pray this together. 
So if we have a common father, that makes us brothers and sisters. God could have revealed this relationship to, this relationship to us in any way that he wanted. He has lots of names in the Old Testament. But here in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, he's shown to be Father. What kind of Father is God? He's all-powerful, omniscient, omniscient, excuse me. He's love, he's mercy, he's, he's, he, he protects, he provides, he teaches. Why does God reveal himself as Father, we're going we're gonna to land here for a little bit. This is going to get a little dense. Can we ever say that God is a mother? Well, Pope Benedict, in, in his book, Jesus of Nazareth, he tells us that in the Old Testament, there is a lot of language about God that seems very motherly. There are several lines about comforting mothers and babes suckling at the breast and, and a mother hen brooding over her chicks. Several lines in the Old Testament that present God in that way. And just as we talk about our relationships and our feelings with parts of our body, you know, we talk about our heart is caught up, you know, our, our, our hearts are caught up in love together. We, we, we're of one mind, you know, and our, with our eyes we see love at first sight and together we go hand in hand. We have all these little language things where we talk about parts of our body. Well, the Jews often use the image of the womb, the woman's womb, right? The mother's womb to convey our relationship with God. This is very interesting. The Hebrew word rahamim is mercy. Rahamim is mercy and mercy comes from the word rahem, which literally means the womb. In the way that for us, we would say our heart is related to love, the Jews would say the womb is related to God's mercy. In Jeremiah and Isaiah and in Hosea the prophet and many of the Psalms, the word for God's mercy is deeply connected to the feminine, to the mother's womb. The mother's womb and the baby is the most real example of, of lives that are interconnected. A love that is total gift of one to the other. Where one literally lives within the other, at least for a period of time, right? So why doesn't the idea of God the mother, like, why doesn't that show up? Do, doesn't that make sense? Well, maybe to our little human minds, it makes tons of sense. But the thing is, God never reveals himself with the title of mother. Jesus never mentions God as being God the mother. This is a mystery and we can seek to understand it. But no matter what we say when we talk about God with, with human terminology and analogies and and human names, like it's all going to get convoluted. But this is how Jesus reveals him. So why is God father and not mother? Here are five things that, that I want to talk about. First of all, initially, we are made, we are not begotten by God. We are not of the same essence and nature of God. So I'll try to explain this using what theologians say with great big, huge words. And I'm going to try to use simpler words and try to explain this the way that the way that I understand it, at least. We are like God in image, but we are created with a human nature. We are not God. We are not created with God nature. Now, later on, God will adopt us and he'll share his na nature with us. He shares his divine nature, right? And through baptism, we become adopted by God and he shares his nature with us. But that comes later. We are different from God. Where Jesus is God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, right? We are human. We are made by God. 
So think of it like this. God is like a carpenter and he he builds something where he puts his craftsmanship, he puts his love, he puts his time into it. But that wooden work of art is not the carpenter. He's separate from his work, right? God is like a painter. He paints an image, but the image is not the artist. He is separate from his work. We are created by God. We are separate from him. We are not the same as he is. Remember in the creed, we say Jesus was begotten, not made, but we were made. We were made by him. To be begotten means to be born in the essence and the nature, to be like the father in essence. We would say for humans, we have the same biology between our human father and the, and the human child. But for God the Son and God the Father, they have the same nature, the same essence. They have godliness. They have divinity. If Jesus were made, he would be like the carpenter project or like the painting, right? But he was not made. He was begotten not made. He is not separate from the Father. He is God from God. But we humans, we were made but not begotten. So we are an image and likeness of, of his craftsmanship, but we're not God. So first we could say we are not God. We are made by God. And that's important because of number two. I said we're going to talk about five things. Number two, if God were a mother and we were born from the womb of God, we would be begotten more exactly in her nature. Because in the womb, the mother and the child share the same blood. They share her body. They have the same nature. So if we came from a God, the mother, if we came from God, the mother's womb, the theologians say we would lose our distinction we would not be human, we would be God. And we can show this through through Jesus in a way. Now, I hope this isn't confusing. This makes sense to me. Maybe, maybe it doesn't to anyone else. I don't know. But Jesus has two natures. So in a sense, you could say he is begotten by God the Father as God, and he's begotten by Mary, his mother, as human begotten by the father and biologically begotten by the mother. Does that kind of help a little? Even though the Jewish traditions follow the fathers, you know, in all the genealogies, so-and-so begot, so-and-so begot, so-and-so, the father's connection to the baby is a little more mysterious and much more external than the mother. So, so in the, in the Jewish genealogies, you know, they're, they're human fathers that beget human children. But here we're talking about God the Father making human children. And, and, and part of the reason he's father and not mother is the father is apart from the baby in a little different way than the mother is. The, the father is still intimately connected. He's still totally necessary. But clearly, he's separate in a way. He's different. Clearly, he's not the mother. Because we don't share the same body or the same essence the way that a mother does with the baby. Right? The father doesn't share the body in the same way. Now, remember, again, this is symbolic reality. This is mystery. This is very confusing. It's not a perfect analogy, but it's the best way we can get our heads around it. So he reveals himself as intimately close to us, as parental, as image producing, but he's still a half step removed from the mother's role. Does that make sense? So thirdly, St. Paul and others make it clear that God the Father adopts us. Paul flat out says that in the book of Romans. And then he shares his nature. Um, Paul writes about that a lot. Peter writes about that. He shares his godliness. So if there was a God the Mother who begot us, 
and we share her nature, we would not need to be adopted by the Father, right? We already would be God, so we wouldn't need to be adopted. So God has to come and get us because we were made. We are not begotten. We have to be gotten because we're not begotten. You get that? We, he has to come get us. We have to be got in, right? I thought that was kind of clever. That was from St. Kathy Blanchard, um, one of our staff members, as, as we were talking about this the other day. I, I really like that. We have to be gotten because we're not begotten. I hope that makes sense. Fourthly, Jesus is the word of God, right? And he knows something that we don't know. In John's gospel, he says, the son knows the father and the father knows the son. And the only ones who are going to know the father are the ones whom the son reveals. And he knows us. He chose this word father to define God. Father. He chose this for us, for our capacity. This is how we can understand and relate to him. No, he's not literally a father in a biological way. But this is the best way for all cultures of all time throughout the world to understand our relationship with God. And the fifth thing, like a male in biology, God starts the process of new life by giving the creative seed, right? In, in biology, the male impregnates, the male plants the seed, right? The male starts it into motion. The male gives and the female receives, the female nurtures. That's why Jesus and priests are male. And all the church is represented as female. The whole church is mother church. The church is a bride. The church is a she. The image is much more than symbolic. It's not just symbolic. It's a true reality that God and Jesus, as, as masculine, they start the life process. They start the sacramental life. They start salvation. And we receive. We, in a, in a feminine way, we nurture. So those are five reasons why God is revealed as father and not mother. I hope it's not too crazy. I hope it's not too hard. The Catechism puts it in pretty clear terms in paragraph 370. In no way is God in man's image. So we're kind of, you know, reverse creating this. We're, we're trying to describe God from human image. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to make God in our image. And the catechism says, he's neither man nor woman. God is pure spirit in which there's no place for the difference between the sexes. There's no place for gender in God. But the respective perfections of both man and women, they reflect something of the infinite perfection of God. Those of a mother and those of a father, and those of a husband. So man and woman together, right? Together, they're created in the likeness of God because God is relationship, right? God is a relationship in and of himself. St. Thomas Aquinas says, that's what this is all about. Fatherhood is all about relationship. And remember that God the Father came first, right? He created us. So when he engineered the idea of human fathers, human families, our human fatherhood is just sort of a really bad attempt to copy the perfect fatherhood of God. Remember, God's fatherhood comes first. And then we kind of copy that. St. Cyprian wrote something that's really interesting. We must remember and know that when we call God our Father, we ought to behave as sons and daughters of God. Isn't that interesting? We are the, the children of the King. We should act like that. God, the Father of love and holiness, he deserves to have children of love and holiness. Just let that
the Jews had an idea of heaven that was very common in the ancient world, and, and it's expressed very well in the, in the book of Genesis. And their view is that the heaven was, there were three levels of heaven. There was the air above us that, that went up to the dome, and they believed that there was a big dome where the sun and the moon and the sky and the, and the clouds kind of hang from that dome right? That was the first heaven, the air above. The space above that dome is where all the waters were kept, and the, the doors of the dome would fall open, and the waters would come down, and that would be rain. And that place where the waters were held, that was called the second heaven. And then the third heaven was the highest point. That's where God lived, the God who created the vast universe. So Jesus is teaching our God he, even though he's our father and he's intimately close with us, he is in heaven. He created the vast universe, billions and billions of stars and quadrillions of planets and moon, yet he's our father. And he wants us to be his children. Our kingdom is not of this world because he is not of this world. So to this father who's in heaven, we pray Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed. The Greek word has as its, at its root, hegios. Hegios, where we usually translate as holy, but holy in a particular sense. To be hegios or hegios, to be holy, is to separate something out for a special purpose. To set it aside as something different. The church building is holy because we use it differently than we do other buildings. The Bible is holy because we treat it differently than we do other books. The altar is holy because we use it differently than we do other tables. So what we're saying, his name and his nature is holy, is hagios, is different from everything else. And we should never misuse his name because it's holy, it's hallowed, right? We shall not misuse the name of Yahweh your God. This is what Deuteronomy chapter five tells us. We will not, uh, he will not leave unpunished anyone who misuses his name, he says in, in Exodus 20 and in Deuteronomy five. You will not swear by my name with intent to deceive and thus profane the name of your God. I am Yahweh, the Lord says in Leviticus chapter 19. Look, we don't have the power or the authority to make him holy just because we say, holy is your name, right? We're just making the statement that his name is holy. We don't make him holy. We just recognize that he's holy. Holy is your name. Hallowed be your name. The Jewish idea, too, is that the name is the person. The name is. Tertullian was an early church father around 200 AD. He was a prolific writer, a theologian, an apologist. He said, when we say hallowed be thy name, we ask that it should be hallowed in us who are in him, but also in others who whom God's grace still awaits, that we may obey the precept that obliges us to pray for everyone, even our enemies. That is why we do not say expressly, hallowed be thy name in us, for we ask that hallowed be his name in all. Isn't that great? That's a wonderful quote. And we pray, thy kingdom come. Well, wherever the king is, there's his kingdom. So what we're saying is, let the king come. May Jesus arrive. May Jesus come to us and be inaugurated. So we're living in a time of Advent. This petition and the next one is sort of a couplet, a rephrasing of the same thing. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? That second part, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, is just, is just rephrasing thy kingdom come comes to bring us the kingdom, and our job is to prepare the way for the kingdom, to help to bring the kingdom, to help bring the king. I mean, really think about what we're praying when we're, when we're saying this.
What am I doing to help the kingdom come? What am I doing to advance the kingdom of God? What am I doing to introduce you and to welcome Jesus into the world? Am I salt? Am I light? Am I over the top with kindness? Am I dealing quickly and decisively with my own sin? Jesus will come. His kingdom will come. And if Jesus were to come back now, what would you say to him? How prepared are you? How sincere are you when you pray, Oh, Lord, thy kingdom come. Let the king arrive. Amen. On earth as it is in heaven, thy will be done. Be careful in what we pray for. His will be done. His will mirrored on earth as it is in heaven. But what is his will? His will is love and multiplication of people and obedience and avoidance of sin and going out into the world on mission. Um, one of the Bible studies that I look at um, for, for research for this is, is uh, Michelle Hunt's Bible study, study, the Agape Bible study. So she points to these scriptures and these passages to talk about what is God's will. In John chapter 6, Jesus says, It's my Father's will that whoever sees the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. In Romans chapter 12, Paul says, Let the renewing of your minds transform you so that you may discern for yourselves what is the will of God. So we're saying, thy will be done. What is your will, God? Transform our minds. What is his will? Ephesians, Paul says, be careful about the sort of lives you lead, like intelligent and not like senseless people. Make the best of the present time, for this is a wicked age. This is why you must not be thoughtless, but must recognize what is the will of the Lord. Recognize the, world, the will of the Lord and be careful to live your life that way. And we also read in 1 Thessalonians, also from Paul, God wills you all to be holy. Right? He wills you to holy. God um, called us to be holy, not to be immoral. God gives you his Holy Spirit. He says this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5. And then in 1 Thessalonians, um, uh, uh, just a little bit later, chapter 5, Paul says, Always be joyful, pray constantly, and for, thing, and for all things, give thanks. This is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. What is his will? Be joyful, pray constantly, give thanks. Pope Benedict says, Where God's will is, that is heaven. Heaven is oneness with God's will. Earth becomes heaven when and in so far as God's will is done there. We, we, we want thy kingdom to come. We want his will to be done. We, we, have to, we have to live in that will. Unite our will with God's will. Our God is not distant, the Catechism says in 2796. He's a father whose place is with his family. In Christ, heaven and earth are reconciled, and who art in heaven refers not to a place, but to God's majesty. Don't think of, don't think of heaven as a, as a zip code, a physical land floating on some cloud. Okay, it's not the third heaven the way the Jews thought of it, where it's this the separate place way up above the dome. It's incredibly mysterious. We're not really sure about it. God is spirit, and the angels are spirit, and heaven is very spiritual, yet we know that there are people that ascended body and soul into heaven. 
Enoch and Elijah and Mary and maybe Moses even. Jesus. We know the fulfillment of heaven will be a new heavens and a new earth. So everything that's material will, will be remained, will be remade. Right? It's going to be totally different. What does that mean exactly? It's mysterious. What is heaven? Why do we pray thy will be done? Is God not able to accomplish his own will himself? Well, God is more than able to do his will without our prayers, without our cooperation. He doesn't need us. Yet he invites us to participate. In fact, he commands us to participate. He's so generous. He shares with us his mission and the of operating his kingdom. What, 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 a, what an immense love this father must have for his children and an immense amount of trust to give us this responsibility. Doesn't that make you want to be holy? Doesn't that make you want to do the right thing? Next is the most dense and complicated part of the Our Father. Give us this day our daily bread. That sounds a little repetitive, doesn't it? A little, uh, uh, you know, we say twice day. Give us this day our daily bread. Well, we are not going to get into it right now and then have to pause halfway through. This is so intense and it's so long. We're going to pick up next week with the lines about the daily bread. So next time we meet, we'll dig into the daily bread. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I love you all so very much. And I love, love the Holy Word. God bless. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much for walking the way through the Gospel of Matthew.